Welcome back investors, Jake here. Hope you're doing well today. In this video, I wanna make a book recommendation and that book would be Richer, Wiser, Happier by William Green. And the subtitle of the book is How the World's Greatest Investors Win in Markets and Life. And basically this book is just a consolidation of William Green interviewing some of the world's most successful long-term investors. So in this book, he talks about these investors among others, but primarily Monish Pabrai, Sir John Templeton, Howard Marks, John Marie Eviard, Joel Greenblack, Tom Gaynor, Nick Sleep, and something that all of these investors have in common, aside from being billionaires, is they adhere to some form of value investing. And the most famous value investors of all time are Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett. They've been business partners since 1959, and the whole school or thoughts, uh, the, the ideas of value investing comes from this man here, Benjamin Graham, who originally wrote the book, The Intelligent Investor, and was Warren Buffett's uh, teacher at university. And William Green puts forward the interesting idea that to be a successful long-term investor, you basically have to be a financial philosopher. He states in the uh, intro of the book, I've come to think of the best investors as an idiosyncratic breed of practical philosophers. They look for advantages wherever they can find them, economic history, neuroscience, literature, stoicism, Buddhism, sports, the science of habit formation, meditation, or anything else that can help. Their unconstrained willingness to explore what works makes them powerful role models to study in our own pursuits of success, not only in markets, but in everyday area of life. For those of you who don't know my background, I discovered the world of finance and investing late, only in the last three years or so. But prior to that, I, I loved to learn. I loved learning about human psychology, human evolution, uh, natural history, world history, uh, even, even economics. But to be a successful long-term investor, it certainly helps to uh, accumulate a, a, a vast body of knowledge and just once again, boil it down to what works. And all of the world's most successful long-term investors have something in common. And that thing they have in common is they are voracious readers. They read a lot about as much as they possibly can. And I know if you're watching this YouTube video, then potentially you're a more visual learner. You like talking to people and interacting with them to learn. However, you just can't beat uh, the good information that you can get that's been consolidated and condensed for you. Yes, it's still potentially a lot of reading and a long book, but this really is the best information you can find for sale that anyone has access to. And in the event that you just find it difficult to find peace and relaxation in your life in order to dive deep into a book, I highly recommend getting a subscription with Audible so you can at least listen to uh, these great books from these great investors or potentially buy the book and then have it read to you through Audible. Lots of people absorb information better when they can both see it and hear it at the same time. And this is a frequent comment I get on my channel uh, in the comments section. People say, Jake, what books did you read to learn how to invest? And this question makes me nervous because usually it's being asked on one of my videos in which I'm actively trading or short-term trading. And what I think they're really asking me is, what's the minimum amount I need to read to get rich fast in the stock market? And unfortunately, guys, I can't recommend a book. No such book exists. If you guys know of one, let me know. But the reason why there's no science uh, to active investing short-term trading is because if there was, then it would be taught in university, uh, the books written about it would be New York Times bestsellers, everyone would be reading them, and everyone would be getting rich. So unfortunately, there is no book about short-term trading or active trading that can guarantee 
<laughs> profits, guarantee uh, profitability in the short term. And another book that I'm going to shout out real quick is The Little Book of Common Sense Investing by John Bogle. He's the founder of Vanguard and the guy who invented the index fund. And the subtitle of this book is The Only Way to Guarantee Your Fair Share of Stock Market Returns to Just Buy and Hold Dollar Cost Average into uh, Low Cost Simple Index Funds Long Term. This is a one and done, read it and forget it uh, strategy to basically win uh, at investing. And the only other style of investing over the long run that can beat index fund investing when done correctly is value investing. Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, and these other successful value investors have outperformed the index funds over 20, 30, or 40 years. So this book by William Green is an exploration of these successful long-term value investors, and Charlie Munger himself says, I believe in the discipline of mastering the best that other people have ever figured out. I don't believe in just sitting down and trying to dream it all up yourself. Nobody's that smart. So everybody needs mentors, teachers, people to learn from in order to uh, get better being a long-term investor. So this book, uh, amongst other people, but primarily uh, met with and talked to Monish Pabrai, Sir John Templeton, John Marie Eviard, Howard Marks, Joel Greenblatt, uh, Tom Gaynor, and Nick Sleep. And the book starts with uh, an interesting fellow by the name of Monish Pabrai, and he's originally from India. He came to America in the 90s, and he decided he wanted to master the world of investing. So he said, who is the best investor of the last century? And that was Warren Buffett. And all he did was read everything ever written about Warren Buffett, watch every speech he could possibly find. He goes to the annual Berkshire uh, conference every year in Omaha. And Pabrai describes his process as cloning, which is a very fun word, but we could also call it modeling, mimicking, and replication. There are, you know, over 4,000 stocks publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange, who really has time to evaluate all of those? So what Prabhai advocates is to find other successful investors and look at their portfolios. That is your starting point. That is your launch, launch pad. Obviously, you're not just copying exactly what they do dollar for dollar. But if they see something in a company, then use that as your stock screener to investigate. What exactly do they see? Can you also see it? Do you also uh, are you also able of convincing yourself of the arguments they made to buy that stock? So Prabhai has been very successful the last 20 years, basically just cloning what other successful investors did. Obviously, he needs to understand it. He wants to also agree with the investing thesis of these other investors. And Prabhai's commitment to cloning raises an array of provocative questions. Is originality overrated? Instead of struggling to innovate, should most of us focus our energy on just replicating what smarter and wiser people have already figured out? Pretty interesting. A common theme amongst value investors is the importance of patience. The number one skill investing is patience, extreme patience. Be patient and selective, saying no to almost everything. Exploit the market's bipolar mood swings. Buy stocks at a big discount to their underlying value. Stay within your circle of competence. Avoid anything that's too hard. Make a small number of mispriced bets with minimal downside and significant upside. And unfortunately, in the finance YouTube community, this is a problem because content creators need to make content semi-daily, I do feel like they are pressured to be talking about and recommending different stocks basically on a, on a daily time scale. But truly successful long-term value investors can go years without buying or selling anything. 
So they look for these uh, diamonds in the rough, basically, that only appear every, every so often. The next investing idea I got from the book that I really like is that of the inner scorecard. Buffett explains that he and Munger always measure themselves by an inner scorecard. Instead of worrying how others judge them, they focus on living up to their own exacting standards. One way to tell whether you live by an inner or an outer scorecard, said Buffett, is to ask yourself this question. Would I rather be the worst lover in the world and be publicly known as the best, or the best lover in the world and be known publicly as the worst? And when people don't really know what they're doing when they invest, they seek this external validation from their family, friends, and peers. Jean-Marie Eviard says it's much warmer inside the herds, and if you're not living by an inner scorecard based on your own uh, valuation system, then yes, you're just looking around you to make sure that everyone else is buying what you're buying. That feels good. That feels comforting to be in the herd where everyone else is. But to successfully beat the index funds long term and have a higher rate of return, you have to you have to be willing to make investments that aren't popular, that will give you criticism from your family, friends, and peers saying, why are you buying that? Nobody else is buying that. What do you see in that? So the inner scorecard is, is very important. Value investing sometimes can be very lonely. Next uh, idea that I like here is hang out with people better than you and you cannot help but improve. This is, uh, once again, advice from Warren Buffett. I forget the saying, but basically, you're the average of the five people that you interact with most. So if one person isn't adding value to your life, I hate to be vicious like this, but you should cut them out and seek out uh, mentors and friends that can teach you more, make you a better person. Obviously, it's important to, get ba to give back and teach and mentor other people, but who are you spending the most time with, and basically, are they making you a better person? The next one I like is from Sir John Templeton, and he said, after all, he had often cautioned that the four most expensive words in the English language are, this time is def different. Whenever we're in a stock market bubble or an asset bubble, people always will make this argument that they should be buying at all-time highs, that the valuations for the company, you know, even though they look high, this time is different. This company is special. This asset is special. So I'm going to remind myself of this, that uh, in the short term, everything might be looking good. This is the 2000.com bubble, but uh, eventually gravity has a way of pulling it all down. Next one I like is from Jean-Marie Aviard. Skepticism calls for pessimism when optimism is excessive. That almost feels like poetry there. But it also calls for optimism when pessimism is ex excessive. So you have to buy at a time when other people are desperately trying to sell. You have to go counter to what everyone else is doing in order to outperform the market in the long run. And Sir John Templeton calls this the point of maximum pessimism, and once I think about this or realize this, I start seeing these points in my own life. And an example I can give to you guys is when I moved to Minot, North Dakota in 2018, I was asking people who were already living there, what's the housing market like? Should I buy my first home there? Universally, everyone told me, do not buy a house in this market. Nobody can sell. House prices are falling. This is a terrible place to buy a home. In 2018, they had reached the point of maximum pessimism. And if I had just bought a home when market prices were down, uh, four years later when I left that city, I mean, I would have made in, in capital appreciation plus equity built in the home over $100,000. Easily, this was the worst financial mistake of my life choosing to rent instead of owning a home for four years. Obviously, there's risk in owning a home, but 
if everyone's telling you, uh, you know, you can't make money doing this, the price keeps going down, it's a terrible idea, potentially that actually then might be a good buying opportunity according to value investors. Uh, the next one I like is from Howard Marks. One of his favorite insights is from the economist John Kenneth Galbraith, an intellectual hero of his, who said, we have two classes of forecasters, those who don't know and those who don't know they don't know. Uh, even a blind squirrel sometimes finds an acorn. And there's a lot of people on YouTube, uh, finance YouTubers, who who just outright say that they can find the next 10x stock or they can predict the future. And for true, successful, long-term investors, nobody can predict what's going to happen next year, five years from now, 10 years from now, who was anticipating a global pandemic would hit the world in the year 2020, who had their portfolio protected or hedged against that, and it was virtually zero people. So once you surrender, once you just understand that you can't predict the future, all you can do is make reasonable assumptions based on past performance, and then position yourself for the best you can. But anybody giving you guarantees on a certain stock or, 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 or the future in general, just be cautious of them because they might be a blind squirrel. Marx continues, the problem is most investors act as if the latest market trend will continue indefinitely. Behavioral economists use the term recency bias to describe the cognitive glitch that leads us to overweight the importance of our recent experiences. Marx notes that the human mind also has a treacherous tendency to suppress painful memories. So let's say there was a hot stock or assets that was going up huge, you then bought into it basically at the top, it immediately crashed and fell 60 to 80% before you sold out in agony. You have a way of suppressing this painful memory and then falling for it again. Let's say you put a little bit of money into this hot stock that's taking off. Over the last two weeks, it's up 10 or 20%. It's so tempting to say, this is great, this is gonna continue forever, I'm going to keep buying in. I'm going to keep adding money because it's it's made me money over the short term. But to be successful long term, you have to fight this recency bias. And additionally, the opposite is true. I get so many comments on my channel telling me I shouldn't be buying and holding index funds because the whole stock market is going down. People who invest in the stock markets are fools. It's all fiat money, the Fed's going to keep printing, uh, the dollar's going to zero, the economy's going to crash. Howard Marks likes to say, most of the time, the end of the world doesn't happen. When you think about what the, what the stock market has survived the last 120 years, from World War I to World War II, the Great Depression, the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet Union... Uh, I, I feel like, yes, the challenges we will experience the next century from the emergence of artificial intelligence to global warming, overpopulation, I still am going to put my money in the stock market, guys, confident that the end of the world just isn't going to happen. A story from the book I really enjoyed was that of Jean-Marie Eviard. And he was uh, managing a mutual fund at the time in the late 90s. So this is 97, 98, 99, and 2000. And while all of these terrible dot-com companies were overinflating in value, he refused to buy them. He was only making purchases for his mutual fund based on the fundamentals of the company. He knew they were overvalued. But as a result of not buying these terrible dot-com companies that all went bankrupt and got delisted, a lot, of his, uh, a lot of his clients and customers who were in his mutual fund, they sold out. Because his fund was underperforming the market by not participating in these overinflated uh, pump-and-dump hype stocks, he was suffering. He almost lost his fund. He almost uh, lost all of his clients and customers. And for people who manage mutual funds, 
they have to chase returns, either on a quarterly time scale or a yearly time scale. Otherwise, their clients pull their money out of their funds. And Warren Buffett has been successful over the last 60, 70 years because he doesn't have to worry about that. Berkshire has the structural advantage of being a public company, not a fund, not a mutual fund that people can pull their money out of. So they're investing permanent capital that can never be yanked away by panicked shareholders. If you run a mutual fund, you're always worried that the shareholder will abandon you if you're temporarily not doing well, says Eviard. To some extent, Buffett has, with Berkshire Hathaway, a closed-end mutual fund. He can't uh, summer from redemptions. So now that you know this, that um, mutual funds and hedge funds have to chase short-term performance, this explains so much with all of these pump and dumps or hype stocks that are always... Anytime somebody says, to the moon, I have to cringe a little. And in the book, we also learn about Nick Sleep and his Nomad Fund, which produced stellar returns above the market average consistently over a long period of time. And he did this by rejecting all of the get-rich-quick tactics that hedge funds routinely use to pump up their short-term performance. High testosterone strategy, Sleep has dubbed investment Viagras. I actually really like this concept and this idea. I kind of want to start using this terminology on my channel of anytime something has already gone up 100, 200, or 300 percent, some IPO, SPAC, or penny stock, and you know people are saying it's going higher, it's going higher, it's going to the moon, Jacob. I mean, it's, it's all just Viagra investing. All you care about is getting it up right now. You don't really care uh, where it goes or how it ends. You just want that, that high to the moon right now. The book continues that Nomad never used leverage, never shorted a stock, never speculated with options or futures, never made a macroeconomic bet, never traded hyperactively in response to the latest news, never dabbled in exotic financial instruments with macho names like Lions and Prides. Instead, Sleep and Zakaria played with what they viewed as a long, simple game, which involved buying a few intensively researched stocks and holding them for years. And this really is a common theme amongst all of these successful long-term investors is that they value simplification. Joel Greenblatt, uh, let's continue here. Simplification is an equally important strategy in more worldly realms such as science and business. For example, scientists often invoke the Occam's Razor Principle, which is attributed to a 14th century English friar and philosopher named William of Occam. But his principle holds that all things being equal, the simplest solution tends to be the best one. So if you're walking around on a farm and you hear hoofbeats uh, in the distance, it's probably a horse. Yes, it could be a zebra on a farm, but what is the simplest explanation? So in the world of science and business, this helps people. But in the world of finance, it's almost the opposite. The late Jack Bogle, who founded the Vanguard Group in 1975, uh, and created the first index fund a year later, observed in a book titled Enough, financial institutions operate by a kind of reverse Occam's, Occam's razor. They have a large financial incentive to favor the complex and costly over the simple and cheap. Quite the opposite of what most investors need or ought to want. And Warren Buffett himself is a grand master of simplification. Writing to his shareholders in 1977, he laid out his criteria for selecting any stock. We want the business to be, one, one that we can understand, two, with favorable long-term prospects, three, operated by honest and competent people, and four, available at a very attractive price. And even though Berkshire Hathaway is one of the most successfully publicly traded companies the last 60 years, 
asked about the crash of 1973-74 when his investment partnership lost more than 50%, he notes that Berkshire's stock price has also halved on three occasions. So from its peak to uh, losing greater than 50% of its value, Berkshire Hathaway has done this three times in its history. If you're going to be in the game for the long pull, which is the way to do it, you better be able to handle a 50% decline without fussing too much about it. And so, my lesson to all of us is, conduct your life so that you can handle a 50% decline with aplomb and grace. Don't try to avoid it, it will come. In fact, I would say if it doesn't come, then you're not being aggressive, aggressive enough with your money. So, just incredible when you think about investor psychology. If you had sold out, if, if Berkshire's share price had declined greater than 50% and you say, I can't take this pain, I can't take this volatility, the stock market just loses me money, I can't do this, and then you sell out at the bottom, this is what most people do. When counterintuitively, this is the best time to be buying. And the final piece of wisdom that Charlie Munger gives in the book is, if all you succeed in doing in life is getting rich by buying little pieces of paper, it's a failed life. Life is more than being shrewd in wealth accumulation. <clears throat> I didn't talk about it too much in this video, but obviously the title of the book is Richer, Wiser, Happier. It's not the money that makes you happy. Obviously, having all of your needs met is pretty important. But for all of these individuals, uh, once they accumulate this vast wealth, they often uh, receive uh, happiness from giving it away, from pursuing phil ph uh, philanthropy uh, and charitable uh, organizations. That's definitely something that hopefully someday I can do once I feel like I have enough to cover my needs and my family's needs. Uh, I definitely would like to uh, be generous and, and give back once, once I reach that point in my life. So in a nutshell, guys, that's the takeaways I got from this book and that I wanted to share with you in this video. If you guys enjoyed this video, give me a thumbs up so the algorithm knows it's good. If you have any comments or questions, I love hearing from you guys. Till the next video, take care.